we're hearing some reports that in some fields there's a lot of whiteheads and in Montana, um, Mary Burroughs, the pathologist at Montana State, put out an alert for uh, that they're, they're seeing a lot of whiteheads in their wheat fields. And um, so one of the things that we think is probably happening this year is that the conditions were so ideal in lots of southern Alberta uh, at seeding and early development that those plants really tillered because they, they had a lot of moisture available, conditions were really nice. And boy, things have changed this week, this last week or week and a half. It's, this is putting some stress on plants. So it could be that when conditions in the environment change so quickly, the plant isn't going to have enough moisture to finish all those heads. And so they just abort some of them. And so that could be one of the causes. Um, a couple of other things that can cause white heads are wheat stem maggot, hessian fly, um, sometimes herbicide injury. If you got your herbicide on a little bit late, and it kind of hung around uh, into that sensitive time. Sometimes uh, it can cause heads to turn a little bit white. Um, and uh, so it's, it's a tough one to diagnose. So if it was a disease, let's say it was uh, take all root rot, and, and other root rots can cause white heads as well, but take alls, that's a classic symptom. How would you diagnose that? What would you look for? Look at the roots. You definitely want to get a good look at the root. So how would you, how'd you do that? I get a shovel with a heart painted on it. <laughs> Thank you. It's important to have the heart painted on the shovel. <laughs> what? 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 <laughs> oh, okay. I didn't know that. You, you definitely want to dig up the root. What happens if you just yank the plant out of the ground? Oh, break off. Yeah. You'll you'll catch the crown roots, but you'll miss some of the tap. And what you really want to look for is. Where the seed germinates, you get this little piece that comes up to the top, and it's called the subcrown internode. So it germinates, there's this little white fleshy piece of uh, tissue, and then crown roots and the plant. You look at the subcrown internode, and if it's got a glossy black appearance, that's really likely to be take all. So that's, that's one way you'd look for root rot issues. Um, other issues in cereals. Uh, Rob mentioned fusarium, so we'll take a minute to talk about that. Uh, we just got the results back from the Canadian Grain Commission last week from the 2016 uh, Fusarium Head Blight Survey. Does anybody remember back to 2015 what the conditions were at this time of the year? Well, maybe even a little later than now. What Were we dry? Were we wet? Were we cold? Were we hot? Dry. And as the crop moved into flowering and, and at the very end of anthesis, what happened in, in a lot of Alberta? got wet. So there were lots of places in Alberta last year where the conditions were really ideal for head blight to get started. Um, that was very different than 2015 where we were dry most of the most of the time. Um, now obviously conditions vary across the province but generally speaking we had really really good conditions for head blight and as a result we saw the the number of counties reporting positives for head blight double um, we saw the number of positives uh, across the province about double and because of the environmental conditions in 2016 we had a lot of positives and so 2016 kind of like 2010 was a year um, uh, that really kind of changed the fusarium situation in the province. Um, when we get dry conditions it tends to hold that disease back a little bit and when we get years where the where we get a lot of moisture during that anthesis period, we can really get an epidemic going, and so that's what's happening. What if you wanted to get an idea of what the risk of fusarium head blight in your area was? What would you do? Fusarium. Go to the wheat hey, thank you, Rob. Does everybody know the Wheat Commission has a, a, a risk? Does anybody want to know more about that, or you guys all? Okay, so if you go on your smartphone to say Google, whatever your browser of choice is. And then go to the Farming Smarter website. Oh, okay. That's and look at our news post. You could, you could link to it from there. But if you type in ACIS, ACIS, that stands for Alberta Climate Information Service. And then once you go to that link, Alberta Climate Information Service, you'll see 
on the left hand side a whole bunch of tabs. And if you go down to the one that says forecasts, there's one that says fusarium disease severity. And you click on there and you can play around with it. You can go to uh, your, the nearest weather station to the field you're interested in. Um, you can get a map that shows the weekly or even the daily uh, risk. Um, and uh, anyway, there's lots on there and I encourage you to go, uh, go and have a look and play around with that. One of the things that's sometimes challenging with fusarium management is, am I going to be wasting my time and money to apply a fungicide to try to manage fusarium head blight? Now, in some parts of the province it's a lot easier to make that decision because Fusarium griminiarum is common. We know it's around and we know that the risk is relatively high and as a result we need to throw all of the management tools available to us to try and keep that disease under control and even then sometimes we won't be able to really control it but manage it to the best of our ability. So what are some things we could do to try and keep Fusarium head blight in its place? We could grow a tolerant variety. So something that has a little bit of tolerance. We'd, um, and we're even starting to get some varieties that are a little bit more resistant. So that's good. Um, what else could we do? Okay, a good crop rotation. If you have cereal stubble still there with Gravinarum on it and you bring a, a cereal crop back in, or the same with corn. So if you have corn stubble with Fusarium Gravinarum on it and then you bring a cereal in, um, you've got a real opportunity to get lots of head blight. What else can we do? Ken mentioned it with the precision planting piece. Seeding rate. What does seeding rate have to do with head blight? Yeah, so a heavier seeding rate will reduce the number of tillers so that your crop is kind of all flowering at one uniform time. Now there's two reasons why that really is beneficial for head blight and one Ken mentioned is that your flowering window isn't spread out for two and a half to three weeks, so it shortens up the risk period. It also lets you, if you are going to apply a fungicide, you can get your fungicide on the target much easier because, because you've, so your target is the anther. When the, when the crop is in anthesis and the anthers are sticking out, that's what you want to get the fungicide on. So if only half the crop is in anthesis, it's pretty hard to protect all the anthers because they haven't been haven't extruded yet. So that, that's another reason. And for irrigation, um, you know, on days like today, I remember last year you could walk through a crop at two o'clock in the afternoon and these pants were still getting wet. Um, I don't think that's going to be the case today. So um, with irrigation, uh, using irrigation in a way that we don't keep the canopy really, really wet that it has a chance to dry out. And we're talking about the period coming into flowering because that's when the spores will be released and also at flowering because that's when disease initiation occurs. Any questions about head blight? If not, I'll move on. Okay. Uh, any other leaf, or sorry, any other cereal diseases top of mind for people right now? Wheat streak. Okay, thank you, Ken. Everybody heard of wheat streak mosaic virus? Okay, uh, we've had confirmed cases of that disease in southern Alberta, Alberta three years in a row now. We had two fields in 2015. We had 22 fields last year, and we've already had a handful of fields confirmed this year. Um, if you have a cereal crop that's showing sort of chlorotic or white or yellow flecks on the leaves, especially at the flag leaf, um, you should probably get that tested for wheat streak mosaic virus. Fortunately, we're moving into the period of the phenology of the crop that that disease is going to have less and less yield impact. If you get wheat streak mosaic very early on, it can actually reduce your yield to near zero. Um, but the later, especially after, uh, after the head emerges and flowering is completed, uh, the ability to affect yield drops off quite significantly. Um, it's, the reason I say it's a good idea to have it tested isn't because there's anything you can do about it at this point. Um, 
unless unless it was a really serious case and you decided to bale it for green feed and get what you could because you thought maybe the head wouldn't fill. Um, but there is no in-season management tool or practice. But if you have wheat streak on your farm, you probably want to know about it so you can be prepared for it for upcoming seasons and so that you can break the green bridge. Everybody wants, who wants to tell me what the green bridge is? Rob? The river and medicine. <laughs> <laughs> Rob, what's the green bridge? Uh, when you have a, an overlap in, you know, from one crop to the next. Seasonal overlap, yes. So let's say you have a spring seeded crop that has wheat streak mosaic virus and you've got the wheat curl mite spreading that all around, and then you plant your winter wheat next to it very early, those mites are gonna jump into the winter wheat and overwinter there and be ready to, and they'll survive there over the winter on that, as long as there's green tissue, right? And the winter wheat will stay green over the winter. If you take that crop of spring wheat off and wait a couple of weeks for all the mites to die, they don't last long, and then plant your winter wheat, then you've broken the green bridge. Everybody understand that principle? Any other cereal? Stripe rust? Mike, are grasses a host for the mite? Yeah, good question. We think they are, um, but they're not very good. So uh, without something like a winter wheat or a volunteer that's gonna stay green uh, over the winter, those mites don't survive very well, especially when we have winters like we did last year. We were hoping that maybe it wouldn't show up. We were hoping that the winter would have taken them out. Uh, spring wheat or whatever, and then you harvest it, and then they jump over into your like a ditch or whatever into grass, and then you seed your winter wheat and it's green. They bounce over to there. Yeah, there. So that can happen, um, but they're not very good at surviving on the native grasses. A lot of the native grasses seem to have wheat curl mite resistance, not all, um, but they don't seem to be as good a hosts. So it definitely gives you a big advantage. There are some uh, wheat, winter wheat and spring wheat varieties, I think, coming out with wheat curl mite resistance and wheat streak mosaic resistance. I know Rob Graff at Lethbridge is working on this in winter wheat. So if it becomes a chronic issue, that's, that's going to be really valuable for us to have. That's a, that's a really good question. I'm going to make a comment about the wheat streak because we, we had it at this site. Laverne blamed us. It wasn't my fault. <laughs> but you mentioned that weather in 2015 here. Mm -hmm. And, you know, there was pretty good drought, but then there were some later season showers. So lots of people had lots of green growth later in the season. And I'm suspecting that's why we, we had more of a green bridging issue out this way. Okay. Does that make sense to you? It does. Um, the heat actually accelerates the life cycle of the mite. Oh, yeah. So in conditions like this, the mite, if it has access to green tissue, it's, it's completing its life cycle in a week. It's going fat, hard and fast right now. So the hot, dry conditions actually are beneficial for the mite, the, the, the vectors, the, the virus. So if you find a, an infected field this year, this season, do you do anything about it? You, you have to take it, like I've heard people take it right out of production. Is that uh, over, uh, not necessary? Or? Yeah, um, so it, it'd be on a case by case. So if you had a really light infection where you could find it in a few spots, I would let it go and see if you'd see how the crop finishes. Um, if every single flag leaf had yellow streaks all up and down and it looked like the head wasn't going to fill, then that's maybe when you consider just taking it off and selling it as green feed and trying to break the green bridge, making sure you don't have volunteers and putting winter wheat in that field. Um, but it's a real case by case. And um, because we haven't really had wheat streak mosaic for the last 20 years. Um, a lot of the people that maybe would have had good recommendations for how to deal this the two or three times we've had it over 50 years, they're all dead now or they're, they're gone. And uh, so we're kind of relearning a few things. Um, and again, we're hoping that, we're hoping that this becomes, uh, you remember the Astor Yellows outbreak in 2012 and then you know, Astro Yellows, what's that now, right? We don't worry too much about it um, when it when it doesn't show it show up like it has. We were kind of hoping Wheat Streak Mosaic would be a flash in the pan like that, but um, we, we're now uh, picking it up again in 2017, so this could be potentially something we have to deal with maybe a little more regularly than we have in the past no, due to a number of things we could speculate on. This can be a pretty darn good uh, way to get 
wheat streaks because you have that secondary growth and then creates the grain bri green bridge on the hot too. Yes. Um, storm systems are also a great way for the wheat curl mite to move around. It doesn't fly, it's passively dispersed. So they, if they start to run out, as the crop starts to turn and, they're, and it's not as green as anymore, they'll climb up to the top of the plant and they'll catch the, whatever breeze is gonna take them somewhere else and hopefully find something green that they can feed on. And so those storm systems really help to spread the mite around. So Mike, the, uh, what, uh, one of the things Ken was, because I think we visited about this earlier too, that if you have a wheat streak field next to a neighbor, it's not an immediate virulent issue to the same extent that maybe other diseases are to that neighbor's field. It, 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 might, it might come in along the edge, but it doesn't, it doesn't pose a huge risk to that nearby field in the sense of it's within the field it can spread. But It's a good point. And, and really, the, I think the key message is it's really challenging to predict where those mites are going to go because they're passively dispersed. So it'll depend on wind currents and how anxious they are to move and how fast the environment drives their life cycle and all those kinds of things. So it, you, if you had an outbreak in a field, it's, you can't really say, well, it's going to move into the adjacent field. They could get caught up on a wind current and be, show up five miles away. I mean, we just we can't really predict where they're going to go. Chances are they're going to end up close by, yeah. but we, we don't know. Yeah. Mike, are crops like rye and triticale susceptible? They are. Wheat is the most susceptible. Um, rye, triticale, barley, um, uh, the amount of damage and the amount of infection. The, the, the mites don't seem to like to feed on those hosts quite as much as wheat. Um, but corn actually is probably as much a host as the rye and triticale are. So we, I haven't seen any symptoms in cornfields, but I haven't scouted for it either. So it's maybe something we need to start looking for in our corn as well. So you'd be looking for corn streak mosaic? <laughs> it would be, we'd still call it wheat streak mosaic. Um, sorghum, same thing. We can see it on that. So a lot of those monocot, monocot crops can all potentially be hosts, but generally we only see economic damage on wheat. It's because it's the most susceptible. Okay. So can, so Ryan Triticale could breed green bridge. They, uh, if it was fall rye or fall seeded stuff that was going to stay green over the winter, yes, yeah, yeah, that's a good point. Okay, that was a great conversation. Um, do we want to take a few minutes on stripe rust? I think we probably should. Uh, not a lot. Um, it did overwinter in a couple of spots, we think. But like last year, just didn't really seem to explode out and cause a big epidemic like it has in some years where some past years where it's overwintered. So we were kind of putting out some mild alerts saying it's out there. Just keep your eye out for it. But one of the things we've heard two reports of now is the potential of symptoms showing up in resistant varieties to an extent that you wouldn't expect in a resistant variety. So I think it's important to continue to scout for stripe rust uh, in all your uh, wheat fields. Um, just because of the, there's always the possibility that a new race is gonna blow in from the Pacific Northwest that could be a little better adapted to temperatures like this or uh, can sidestep the resistance genes that we've deployed. So I think it's important to keep an eye on it. Um, I'm not pushing any panic buttons, um, but I think it is, it's an important one that we need to keep our eye out for. This kind of weather is going to help activate the resistance genes in most of the cult resistant cultivars. Those high temperature adult plant resistance genes are going to be functioning really effectively right now. As the crop matures and the temperatures are hot, that's when it's the most resistant. And a dry canopy also prevents the spores from being able to initiate disease. So this, this weather is helping us out a lot, but we are still hearing and seeing evidence that stripe rust is out there and threatening to um, take a run. So we, we should keep an eye out for it. Okay, let's move to peas, pulse diseases. Uh, I'm interested to know what you guys think, and there's no right answer to this one. 
What do you guys see as the biggest threat to peas and lentils right now, as far as diseases go? Okay, I heard of phantomyces. I think I also heard hail. Did I somebody said that say that? Can. <laughs> can you see the clouds building? Can, can is the biggest threat to peas on this farm. <laughs> Uh, yeah, um, I think that's, um, I think I would agree with that. Root rots in peas have become, uh, they, they've been increasing in severity and incidence and there's no sign that they're going to go away. And, and I think this is a really important, um, I think this is a really important thing to discuss and be ready to deal with. Yes. Is there much you can do about that? Because I think we've seen a, a lot of increase in that in our even in our plots and stuff and you go through and it's not something that you look like you can spray, but you definitely see, you know, you have all this nice plot and all of a sudden there's just a splotch of something that looks like it's just disintegrating almost. Yeah, so how let's talk specifically about a phantomyces now since that's the one that came up. We also have fusarium, which is a major player in root rots, but let's talk about a phantomyces. When we're looking at above ground symptoms, what usually happens with the phantomyces infections? The crop comes up, grows pretty vigorously, looks good right up until about when? Kind of right about now or maybe a little earlier than now, at just before flowering or at flowering. Um, a couple of things are usually happening at that point. Um, there's a lot of requirements, a lot of moisture requirements for the crop because this is usually kind of a dry time and also the crop is going reproductive and it's sending a lot of energy into making pods and filling them. And so as a result of that if this root system has been weakened in any way that's when you're going to start to see those symptoms really pronounced. And so oftentimes the crop looks great, the canopy looks really nice until right kind of at that flowering time and all of a sudden everything starts turning yellow or patches turn yellow or strips turn yellow and, um, and, the, and then there's a really serious amount of economic loss that incurs from that point on. So it's really challenging to predict um, because it starts out looking so good. And so the question I think that or the comment that Mike raised is well what can we do about that? Well at that point nothing. There isn't anything that can be sprayed. There isn't any operation, farm operation that can be done to turn that around. So as a result of our, you know, as a result of that, we have to look at um, management of this problem kind of the season before. So if you have a field that had a wreck, a root rot wreck last year or the year before, don't put peas or lentils in there. That's a bad idea because it's probably going to happen again. So a good solid crop rotation. Um, Did you say even like a cereal root rot? No, we're just talking kind of about a phantomyces right now. So you're saying if you had root rot and pulses, don't grow pulses again? Yes. Okay. Yeah. So, and, and I'm, making the con I'm making this point that if you had two years ago peas there, don't think that lentils are going to do any better there because they're both equally as susceptible to that problem, okay? Um, so soybeans will do better, dry beans will do better, faba beans will do better. The phantomyces isn't an aggressive uh, root rot problem on those crops. But peas and lentils, um, you just have to avoid those fields that have a high amount of inoculum in them. So avoiding fields that have that. Now there's a second thing that uh, predisposes peas to and lentils to this root rot issue, and it's either heavy clay source, uh, fields that drain poorly um, or that just kind of stay water waterlogged or have a lot of compaction, okay? So the soil characteristics of some fields aren't going to be great for peas or lentils just because their root systems are going to have a hard time and then you add a phantomyces to it and they're done. So um, that's the second, that's, and I call that field selection. And then the third thing is uh, applying a seed treatment that will control both fusarium and phanomyces is going to be an important bit. Now, you can't manage a phanomyces currently with root rot or with uh, seed treatments, but you can give your crop that good, healthy head start during that critical period um, and give it the best possible chance. 
So right now, that's really the best we can do. Now, there's a lot of research going on looking to breed some tolerance into pea varieties, uh, looking at in-season applications to help activate the plant's ability to fight off um, the, the root rot issues. And so there's work being done, but right now there's no magic product that I know of that's going to turn things around. So we have to try to think ahead and just avoid fields where we're going to have root rot issues on those crops. And that can be challenging because in fields where the inoculum levels are high, you may have to stay out of those susceptible crops for seven, eight, nine years. So that's tough because we love to see peas in rotation for, especially as a pathologist, give, the, give things a break from the canola wheat uh, rotation that's common in some parts of the province. So we love seeing acres of peas and pulses in and also because of the soil health and the fertility benefits of them. So that's a tough one, but that's the reality with Aphanomyces. We just don't have, we, we don't have anything great that's going to uh, turn things around yet. Did you get root rots in more often in low spots? Yes. Yeah, so especially with Aphanomyces, it has a it has a spore that swims through the water films in the soil and without water it can't infect. So that's why lots of times you'll see either at the low spot or at the margin of the low spot where the conditions were just ideal, you'll see really severe root rot symptoms there because that's where the soil moisture conditions were really perfect for infection of the crop. Mike, there's been a claim out there that the group three chemistry actually suppresses the phanomyces somewhat. Have yeah. you heard or seen anything? <clears throat> so the leading the charge on the root rot work is Shama Chatterton, Dr. Shama Chatterton at Lethbridge, Ag Canada Lethbridge. And I'm a collaborator of hers on that project. And so we have two sites and Shama has two sites where we're investigating exactly that to see if there's an effect. Um, there is published literature from the US saying that it is the case. Uh, our first couple of years of research hasn't borne that out. And we think that it may be because the rate that we're, the rates that we have registered by PMRA here in Canada aren't high enough to see the effect. So starting this year, we've actually used the, the label rate and then double the label rate. So we actually have both of those to see if, if increasing the, the rate is going to allow us to see an effect. So, so far we haven't been able to verify that that's the case, um, but uh, hopefully, fingers crossed, we'll, we'll be able to see that at maybe some of the higher rates we can see some suppression. One of the other issues we have is that when we go to do these trials, um, it's extremely challenging to prepare inoculum and then evenly blanketed across the field. So what we have to do is go into a field that we know has the disease and then just take what we get. And sometimes the fields are so hot with disease that it doesn't matter what management practice, everything dies. So, you know, the peas are at the 12 node stage and they're that tall and they just turn yellow and tip over um, because there's just too much disease pressure. So um, over time, as the disease mellows in that, as the disease pressure sort of um, mellows a bit in those fields, we're hoping to get some better results. Uh, so we're up against some of those kinds of challenges. So we don't know the answer yet, but we're working on it. I've got a few fields that are like that, and what I'm actually doing is getting the customer to go in the out of pulse years to use the group threes as, as some herbicide control. Um, I mean, Liberty Link Canola, you can still use Edge on. Yep. So uh, that's what he's doing, and then he's using Avidex in other cereal fields and then staying out of that rotation for at least five years. So he won't be, he won't be pulseless for four more years. Now. Yeah. So I'm kind of hoping that and has some effect. That's a sound strategy based on what we know right now. So I think that sounds really good. Uh, I'll mention one more thing. So the, one of the things that we need to be able to do better is predict the risk of a phanomyces. Cause right now, you know, you say, well, I, I applied group three herbicides for four years. I've been out of peas and lentils for four years. Is it time to go back with peas or am I gonna have another wreck? And right now we don't have a great answer for how to sort of uh, put your finger on the pulse of what is gonna happen. Ah, oh, that's another great pun there. I didn't even realize that. Um, and uh, so uh, Dr. Chatterton is working on a soil test that will predict the risk of 
uh, root rot, Aphanomyces and Fusarium root rot. Now that's challenging because of how patchy those can be distributed in the soil. So it may come down to that test being as good as the soil sampling that's done. Um, and you may have to do a schwack of it to get a good, a good uh, predictive test. But uh, hopefully within the next year or two, there will be something that you could send a soil sample away and have a result come back saying, your risk is six and a half out of 10 that you're, that, uh, for aphanomyces in that field. So that, that'll be something that could help a lot at knowing when is it kind of gonna be, when is the risk low enough that we can go back in with a pea crop? Okay, I think I'm done. Keep <laughs> 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 <laughs>